Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to this Knee One clinical session, A32. My name is Mary Lloyd Ireland. I'm an orthopedic surgeon from Lexington, Kentucky. I work at the University of Kentucky, and I have some very distinguished uh, people for discussion with me. Nyla Coleman is a pediatrician, sports medicine from Pennsylvania, surrounded by people from Pennsylvania, and um, Mark Lovely is from York, Pennsylvania. So the format, and we'll keep to this as best we can, uh, is uh, each session is 20 minutes, history and physical for five minutes, then here's where the audience comes in, questions for a couple of minutes, uh, then differential diagnosis, test, five minutes, and then discussion, and we really want you to ask questions. This session is for you to uh, get your answers, and uh, you've got the panelists uh, to pipe in, but also uh, the discuss the uh, presenters are here to ask questions about the cases and you know what they learned from the cases, maybe some pearls, and how they would do things differently the next time. This is one that I have to recuse myself from because he's a University of Kentucky sports medicine fellow, so I've got to keep my mouth shut for once. Uh, knee swelling in a 10-year-old traumatic or atraumatic C.J. Rollison, primary care orthopedic uh, resident or uh, primary care sports medicine uh, fellow uh, from the University of Kentucky. All right, good, at, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this case, um, we talk about a 10-year-old, um, no disclosures, unfortunately. Um, in true Kentucky fashion, this uh, 10-year-old was playing basketball a couple of weeks before she presented to our primary care sports medicine clinic. Had a little bit of a traumatic injury. She just fell down and fell onto her anterior right knee. However, pain had improved, but the swelling in her knee had persisted over the time since her injury um, was what prompted the presentation to our clinic. No past history of any knee injuries um, to this knee. Mom did say several years prior, when she was much, much younger, um, had some different swollen joints. She couldn't recall which specific ones, but they resolved um, without any treatment or intervention. No pertinent other past medical history, not anything in the family. Um, no fevers, chills, no weight change, negative review systems. On exam, she looked well and healthy, did not look sick, did have the severe fusion that you can see on the right side and subsequently limited um, active range of motion um, from the swelling. Um, her ligamentous exam was stable, no joint line tenderness, um, but did have a decreased amount of quad strength um, just mechanically from that amount of effusion that she did have. We got plain radiographs um, on the way in the door that did not show any obvious fracture or um, effusion. Um, growth plates were still open, or, or sorry, there was a small superpatellar effusion that was appreciated there um, that you can see on the lateral films. Um, subsequently, after the effusion, we ordered an MRI. Um, here you can see the large fusion, some synovial perfor perforation, um, no bony findings, the ligamentous structures were intact. Um, the top of this film is kind of where the MRI cut off so we couldn't really see the superior most portion of the superpatella pouch. It extends pretty, pretty far up the, the, up the femur. So that's where it kind of cuts off there, but what's all this stuff? So all that that's um, uh, hyper, hypertrophy of the synovium, um, um, which is not normal in appearance, um, for sure. Um, at that point, um, we also had some things we got um, lab work. For the most part, it was pretty normal. Um, SED rate was a little elevated. The ANA was um, less than 1 to 80. Um, but negative RF, negative anti-CCP. Um, any additional questions as far as her initial presentation and workup? Was there any uh, family history of swelling or? No, uh, mom had said there was no family history to her knowledge, both personal and, and her parents or on, in the family as far as any um, joint swelling or rheumatologic type diseases. Any insect bites of any kind? Um, none that um, they knew about. This was in the middle of winter in Kentucky. Um, but, um, yeah, no, no insect bites in her past. Okay. 
Is there Lyme disease in Kentucky? We actually have seen some uh, Lyme caused effusions uh, recently this past year. One other question. Um, sometimes with celiac disease and some other uh, uh, Crohn's and, and other things, uh, did you have any bowel issues or anything like that? Uh, no, no bowel issues, no belly pain, no um, irregular stools, no cramping. No history of gout in the family? No. Okay. All right. So at that point, I um, had a couple things on our working diagnosis. Um, uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, previously known as juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, given her swelling in the past history of swelling. Could this be PVNS with the um, large effusion in the Snowville findings on her MRI? Um, septic arthritis with that large effusion, sometimes the synovium can appear like it did, but she didn't look sick at all. Um, osteochondral fracture or an OCD lesion, um, but we didn't really see those on the MRI. Although, um, uh, different bleeding diathesis, especially hemophilia, more predominant, obviously, in the male population. It's, we kept that on, that was on the differential. And then um, lipoma arborescence, which um, is a little um, uh, fatty deposit in the synovium, typically doesn't look quite like our MRI, but it's still something to uh, think of. So given her persistent fusion, she did also have um, a grossly bloody aspiration um, in the MRI findings we did plan for. Um, surgical evaluation. So you can see here um, kind of that aspirate it is pretty grossly bloody um, as they got her prepped in the OR um, to move forward with the procedure. And then once we they got in there, um, got a couple other videos coming up. You can see the reddish brown. Uh, synovitis that is present. Um, I believe the top left is more the um, medial pouch and medial recess. The upper, upper right is the lateral one. They get to some of the super patella pouch and um, just kind of give you an idea just generally on different parts of the how expansive the synovial involvement was in this case. Um, extensive synovectomy was performed and sent to the lab. Um, um, so those biopsies could be further evaluated under the microscope. Um, and with that, um, the, when the path came back, um, did have a papillary architecture, giant cells, foam cells. These were all consistent with pigmented villanodule synovitis. This isn't her um, path slide. I was unable to obtain that, but this is kind of an example of see the papillary architecture um, from the PBNS. Um, so that was our final diagnosis, um, PBNS. Um, definitely more on that medical side of things as far as the persistent effusion and the grossly bloody tap and, of course, the um, synodal findings on her MRI. So post-op, we saw her back to go over the results, um, compression cryotherapy to keep working on the swelling. It took her a good bit of time to finally achieve full range of motion and get that strength back since it was a couple months between um, initial injury or initial presentation and surgical treatment. Um, I guess there could be some debate about did that fall and injury flare up the PVNS or is just kind of an incidental she happened to have a fall and then really noticed the swelling and um, then we ended up finding this on workup. Um, after, for follow-up, no return in swelling. Um, these are the most recent radiographs that were normal. She's doing all desired activities, having a great life. Um, and, no, and we're currently, currently planning on, I believe, yearly follow-up with repeat films and just making sure this stays at bay. Um, that's kind of an important thing is the PVNS can be, even though it's monoticular, it can be pretty locally aggressive and affect that synovium, and that's something you want to make sure that it doesn't recur, especially given her young age. This is more, PVNS is a um, process that is more prominent in the third to fifth decades of life, and um, so she is quite young to actually get this. Um, it has been seen, I think, down to the age of nine when I did a lit literature search um, as far as the youngest case, but um, ours is pretty close to that. Any additional questions or thoughts, discussion? 
this is a great example of <clears throat> having a very broad differential because I don't think PV and S would have been on my high in my differential would have been there. But because of the age, I would be thinking things like hemophilia and 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 other things. So it's good, you know. I always champion if you don't if it's not on your differential, you won't find it. So having that broad differential uh, was key. You know, obviously the MRI did help with that, and and then of course the arthroscopy pictures. I think the bleeding um, diathesis or disorder is key because sometimes as orthopedists we see that or we see a family history of factor something uh, and uh, we actually have a case of factor seven uh, deficiency and you know patients don't know about it but it certainly is familiar on and I guess they don't think it's important. I had a young man I was doing an ACL on he was a uh, his sport was a lumberjack. Uh, and he got drunk and fell down the steps. But uh, anyway, his mother had a bleeding problem that he didn't let, she didn't let him know. And they happened to be in the same room the, the morning of surgery. And so we had to test him real quickly to make sure that we weren't going to have a problem. Back about 10 years ago um, on our Olympic team in Olympic weightlifting, we had a gentleman with a hemophilia. Um, so when we traveled overseas, I got to carry two vials of uh, Factor H, each worth about $15,000 each. Um, and I got very, very nervous. So, I mean, we can help these athletes that do a bleeding diathesis, but, you know, you got it's, if it's not in your differential, if you're not thinking about it when they come in with these swollen, swollen knees, uh, you can miss it. I think the other thing to think about is, you know, a lot of 10-year-olds fall on their knees, and she had this big swelling. It's like, what's going on? So it's good that you went further. Uh, most people would just say, why don't you relax, rest it, and stuff like that, and you went further. So that's important to think about those things that don't quite make sense. Yeah. Thank you. You know, I like the saying, you may not have seen it, but it has seen you. And sometimes when you're seeing these children with these huge effusions, the kids don't know it's important. It's a problem, you know, and so you really have to examine them and talk to them and figure out, was there really a, an injury? Because this kind of sort of was, but kids fall down all the time. So if they have that, if the exam is out of uh, proportion to what the clinical history is, then uh, then you got to think of something else. And, you know, I don't jump to do MRs on anybody too quickly, but sometimes you have that one window of opportunity to order an MRI scan. Um, was it, did you ever look at, um, I don't know how prevalent ultrasound is in your practice, but was there ever any idea or opportunity to look at this effusion under ultrasound? Um, in this particular patient, not, not at that time. You know, that's just more recently that um, we've had a little broader access to ultrasound in the actual clinic. That might be something uh, to, you know, if you're going to see this person in follow-up, um, very inexpensive way to look at soft tissue, um, you know, uh, and very quick point of care. It's interesting. Now we have ultrasound in the next hallway before it was uh, not even on my diagnostic test, but I think that is uh, that is uh, really important. And from an orthopedic standpoint, when we do these, and you saw that in the synovial chondromatosis, you want to do as much of a synovectomy as you can, but I think that case demonstrates well the synovium is everywhere. I mean, it is crawling around the ACL, PCL, up around the menisci, so we have to make accessory portals. And fortunately, the ones that I've taken care of, the uh, uh, single joint uh, PVNS have not recurred because then if they recur, you have to get into some other treatments, even radiation. Obviously, you wouldn't want to do that in, in this child. And I have tried to see her every year just to see what her joint spaces are going to look like because that, that is a synovial invasive, what is the articular cartilage going to do? And I'm a little more concerned about a PVNS causing problems than a synovial osteochondromatosis. How long did it take you to do that synovectomy, Mary? Probably 70, 80 minutes, something like that. Was it complete? As complete as I could see. I'm sure there's synovium lurking. I got rid of all the, the rusty stuff. Come on, audience. Question. Got to have them. We haven't answered every. They're waking up. They're waking up. They're waking up. I got a question. With her being 10 years old, um, her growth plates are still open. Um, for her to fall on her knee, will that cause like a cause the bone to harden and possibly affect the growth plates at any point, or could that interfere with her growth at all? Um, the question was about uh, this being a pediatric patient in the open growth plates with the fall. Um, I think a lot of times that is more with mechanism of injury and how severe the fall was. This was just more of a running across the ground, a ground level fall. Um, 
you definitely have the on the differential with that trauma, a growth plate injury or Salter Harris one type fracture that can present with normal radiographs, although that wasn't um, consistent with our patient's exam. Typically, if you'd have more of the higher grade, like a Salter 4 or 5, where there's actually tr um, injury through the growth plate, that's where you get more of a concern as far as um, early cessation of growth. Um, but um, that was not the case in this particular patient. With that amount of swelling, if you have an acute injury, and hers was kind of sort of, I fell playing basketball, it wasn't really that significant, but you think about a patellar dislocation with an osteochondral fracture, usually off of the patella. You think about a tibial eminence fracture, so an avulsion of the ACL as it attaches on the tibia, some type of a chondral lesion. She might have knocked off, let's say, an osteochondritis, a secans lesion, an ACL. Uh, and my concern with her is if she had swelling for a period of time, her bone might have got a little osteopenic. Uh, so to get back, if she's not an athlete, but to get back to running, you might want to put her on a slow return to weight-bearing activities. But we're not really concerned about her growth plates, really, in this situation. More about the articular cartilage since she has a synovial process. Your comments about Salter Harris fractures? Well, uh, you, you know, you're at, like, as I said earlier, your average child falls all the time, uh, and a lot of them won't sustain any kind of really injury to the growth plate. It takes a lot of force uh, to hit just uh, at that area to do that. So you would see more assaulter fractures in ankles and stuff in kids than you would at the knee. Distal femoral assaulter Harris fractures have the worst prognosis with a short limb or an alignment issue. Uh, I've been in practice now longer than I would like to admit, but in the past 30 years we've changed where I guess we would do an MRI scan in an acute Salter Harris if you couldn't really see it. Uh, CT scan gives us more about the bone, but in the olden days, pre-MR, we would even do stress views. Anybody do stress views anymore? Oh, Lordy, no stress views. <laughs> stress views can really tell, uh, you, you know, a gentle stress view, but uh, so what's the next step of Salter Harris, CT or an MR? Well, uh, with most Salter Harris, actually, we just we stick with the x-ray, and then we go from there. If we have worry about some other injury that is associated, then we won't get an MRI. seems like MRI scans give you a little more bang for your buck in that you can look at the menisci and look at the ACL. But typically, if you have a Salter Harris fracture, you're not going to have involvement of the ligament. You're going to have the bone breaks, and everything else is okay. I want to touch upon something Mary Lloyd uh, brought up about the tibial eminence fracture. I've seen a couple of these in my career. Um, and I always think that's, and we're a little off subject here, but um, the, how do you repair them? Because it was very interesting and um, because it, it, it looks and smells like a, an ACL rupture, um, but is repaired a little bit differently. Uh, so there's a classification that's an old classification, Myers McKee, uh, McKeever. And uh, if they reduce an extension, we don't operate on them. Most of the ones that I see are displaced uh, because the ACL is tugging on that tibial eminence piece. And the intermeniscal ligament, anterior horn of the medial or the lateral meniscus, more so medial, I've seen it more lateral, gets underneath the fragment. So basically it usually is displaced. Fortunately, the ACL is usually not involved so that we have a fracture and we don't have a avulsion fracture of the ACL attachment and an ACL injury in a skeletally mature because that would be a little harder to figure out. Do you want to just take the ACL out or you, you try to, usually we try to fix these. And you can fix them several different ways. You can use drill holes with a suture on top. I like using a cannulated 4-0 screw, go into hyperflexion of the knee, make an accessory portal, and then put a couple of screws in. And the screws are in the bed of the ACL so they don't have to come out. Actually, I guess uh, back to the uh, distal femoral um, salter fractures, uh, the one that you can always miss is the salter 4. And actually, I had one that came to clinic, and we missed it. You couldn't see it on x-ray, and uh, we couldn't explain this kid's injury, so we actually got an MRI, and the radiologist called, and he said, I only see a Salter 4, and MRI at that point isn't helpful for staging or anything like that, because he'd had it for a few weeks then. Uh, but he was stable, so we just kind of watched him. And we talked about protecting our athletes and our children. Um, you know, I've had some Salter Harris fractures that come in, uh, you know, ones or twos of the proximal tibia or the distal femur, and you see callus at two weeks because they're still limping. So hopefully if the parents will bring them back in. But I do think an MR acutely, if you're it's painful over the bone. I mean, they hurt over the bone. They don't have as much of a hemarthrosis, but they hurt over whatever, salt, whatever uh, growth plate they've injured. 
Thank you very much. Right. Thanks, everyone. Great discussion. Go Cats.